Hey everyone, today we're taking apart the 1660 Super. So we've already reviewed it, and it's it's a bit of a, a cluster, it's a confusing stack that NVIDIA has created. It's, uh, it's got quite a few cards now. So I was actually wrong. I said there were 12 NVIDIA GPUs released in the last 12 or so months. It's actually 13. I missed one, the Titan RTX. But today we're taking apart the 1660 Supers. We have two in. We have the EVGA model that we reviewed, and this is an MSRP model, or it should be about $230. And then we've got a Gigabyte model as well that we're going to be taking apart, and we don't have a video up on this yet, but if there's enough interest, we might, we might put one together. So uh, let's get started. We'll start with the EVGA GTX 1660 Super. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Be Quiet Dark Rock Slim, keeping a high performance focus but reducing the footprints to accommodate full memory slot compatibility. The Dark Rock Slim comes with one of Be Quiet's Silent Wings 3 120mm fans built for low noise operation. The Dark Rock Slim advertises cooling capability up to 180 watt TDP, but mixes in a matte blackout color design to combine performance and looks. Learn more at the link in the description below. So here's the 1660 Super. The V BIOS on this targets a temperature of about 67 degrees. A lot of people get caught up in thermals for video cards, and you have to remember a few things. The first one is that they all follow a VBIOS profile. So if this is set to 67 and another card, maybe let's say, I actually don't know what this one's set to off the top of my head. Let's say this one looks, is set to 70. In a thermal chart, A versus B, it's going to make it look like the EVGA one in this made up example is better. But in reality, it might just be that this one's got a higher VBIOS temperature target. And so the fans might spin slower if, if they were like for like same cooler uh, or other things like Noise levels are a consideration as well, which we talk about in all of our thermal benchmarks. But anyway, the temperature target on this is about 67 for where, where it likes to be. Tends to, uh, tends, tends to spin kind of aggressively once you start pushing the clocks, but we're at maybe 2300 RPM or something for the higher temperature or higher load scenarios. But taking it apart should be pretty easy. We've got four screws. UJ puts this tamper seal here, but it is not a warranty void if removed sticker from what they tell me they don't void the warranty if that has been tampered with, but uh, it would give them reason to look a little closer. So, yeah, don't mess anything up. Or just get a, a jimmy and lift it up a little bit. You might want to heat it up first. But anyway, it's pretty easy to get off. So four screws. This should immediately give us access. You can see there's six of these uh, screws for a just through the PCB into the back plate. There's no base plate on this card, so we don't have any any base plate in this area. Uh, we'll look closer to see if there's anything on the memory. And then there's a couple more screws on the other side coming through as well. We'll look at those in a moment. But this should be free now. This is why we're doing two cards in one video because it's really not that difficult to take this apart. Okay. Wow, this is actually insane. Maybe I should maybe I should do some memory thermal testing on this. Now that we've got it open, we can. So, uh, just a typical disclaimer, all of our testing is done before opening the card. In the review all of that was already done. Uh, so yeah, this is going to maybe deserve a bit of a custom test on the memory temperature. Unlike other cards on the market, these NVIDIA cards don't expose their memory thermal sensors or MOSFET thermal sensors through software. So the only way to really get it is through hardware monitoring, which we can do with thermocouples. Now that it's open, it'll be easy. But the insane part is uh, obviously that EVGA has taken maybe a cooler that already existed and made it work by using... How, how much is this? Let's see. This whole stack, counting the memory, mind you, this whole stack is 9.5 millimeters tall. Let's just check one of these. Let's check. Let me get a closer look. Oh, there's some exposed. The uh, top of the memory module is exposed over here, so I can actually just rest the caliper on top of that and eliminate that from the height. That is a 4-ish, 4.3 millimeter thermal pad that's freaking crazy and then is this this is also about four three that's absurd it's better than not making the connection but evga 
So here's a few things that should be all basic to our regular viewers, but um, not everyone's a regular viewer. So with thermal interfaces, the rule is fewer interfaces is better, first of all. So between GPU, which is that, and the cold plate, you have one interface. The cooling medium is this cold plate, copper cold plate. It contacts silicon, both silicon and, uh, and it's got a, a diffusion barrier on top of it, but both the silicon and the cold plate are highly conductive thermally. Thermal paste sits in between them to fill kind of like microscopic imperfections in the surface and level things out. These are not perfectly level copper plates. And likewise, the silicon is also not perfectly level. So paste is your one interface here. That's really the ideal way to do this. With memory, what you want is maybe a 0.5 to 1.0 millimeter thermal pad connecting the memory to typically some other, like this, for example, some other plate. This is from, uh, this is not a, the best example, but it's an example. This is the XFX thick plate. It's not the best example because it's stainless steel, which is a bad conductor relative to aluminum. But the idea is the same, which is that typically you have a plate like this, you've got a one millimeter pad under it, and then you solder or weld this plate to the, uh, the fin stack or whatever it may be, heat pipes, fin stack, whatever. So that's normally how you assemble these things. EVGA, for whatever reason, has, uh, well, we know the reason, it's to make it cheap. EVGA has decided to take nine millimeters worth of thermal pads and double stack them. So and they're not even aligned. <laughs> like, this is overhanding too. But at this point, honestly, that difference is probably irrelevant. So they're double stacking them so now you're transferring memory, memory flip chip, so it's against the PCB. So flip chip module, on top of that you have the black uh, box. That's a monster thermal pad. <laughs> so uh, yeah, there's the actual outer, everyone's seen that I think at this point. So it's the module, so flip chip module uh, cover, and then that conducts into a thermal pad, which is then now over here conducting into a second thermal pad and then that's conducting into whatever the fin stack, you can see the indent of the, sort of the, the not quite L-shaped fins on top of it. You can actually see the indent of the, the, the copper heat pipes in here too. So there's a slight outline, are you able to see that? There's a slight outline here and over here, and that's because one of these heat pipes or both of them actually are contacting the thermal pad. So to that extent, it's good that it's making contact, sort of, but this could have been improved by EVGA, and it should have been with, with this side of things. This, this should be lower, or they should have, this all, it's easy to say they should have done something. It all comes back to cost, obviously. But another option that's less common is EVGA could have considered doing perhaps just like this kind of small section of separate uh, fin stack to stick on top of the memory or whatever. There's a lot of ways this could have been done better. And this thing, just for the example, I think this came from a Sapphire Nitro Plus 5700 XT. So that's unfortunate because it just means that the thermal transfer is not as good as it should have been. Um, I, I really can't overstate how crazy it is to have nine millimeters of thermal interface and all of it is cheap thermal pad. Like that's actually, it's, <laughs> I'm surprised they didn't just leave it not connected at all. So I'll give EVJ credit for for doing this much because companies like Asus would just leave it without any any coverage whatsoever, as evidenced by their recent low end cards. So anyway, that's the the basis of it. Let's look at the cooler. Cooler is pretty simple. Copper cold plate, and the uh, you can actually tell by looking at this this patch of thermal paste that they're using a silk screen to apply it. Some companies do, some don't. But the end result is that you do get a fairly even and good spread of compound across the die. So we have two heat pipes. These look like they're probably eights. It might be six. Oh man, is that a 10 for real? Well, they've also done 10 millimeter heat pipes, which are really uncommon these days. Not, I mean, they're just kind of expensive, which is an odd, but whatever. That's probably all they could really fit in there. Let's clean off the die. There's your die. That's a TU-116-300-A1 
is this revision of NVIDIA Silicon. So the TU-116 is on all of the 1660 cards. So that's a 300 A1. The A1 is just, that typically never changes. That's the, uh, the revision number. So it's TU-116 is the die, 300 is the subset of the die, and then A1 is the revision number if there are any changes typically. That's how it works. Okay, uh, and then this thing, there's really no other interesting elements. I could point out that the fin pitch and density is uniform, except you have some changes here where they have the L-shaped fins that flatten out at the bottom. Typically, this is used for direct contact with things like right here too, or for some strength, for example, against the cold plate. So that's all that is. And uh, I think that'll cover that cooler. Really, really odd decision. EVJ's card wasn't hot on the GPU. It did fine, like as an acceptable, but I, I need to perhaps look at the memory temperature. I'm curious now. All of that will depend on if anyone actually cares about this product. If no one watches, then, <laughs> then I guess that'll be the answer. So here's the Gigabyte 1660 Super we got in. You can kind of tell by looking at it straight away that it's a pretty simple card. It's one of their triaxial designs. There's three sets of aluminum fin stacks. Uh, and actually, this one is just more of that raw aluminum look. And three sets of those, a couple of heat pipes connected to them. Should be a pretty easy job. Let's take this apart, and we can maybe talk about PCB components after that for both of these. So for the tools I'm using today, all this work's being done on the GN ModMat, the large ModMat. You can find it on store.gamersnexus.net. We just restocked them, actually. Just got the shipment in, so if you order, they'll ship as they're ordered. Uh, we're not on back order anymore. So you can place orders, they'll go out right away. And then the toolkit I'm using is the Gamers Nexus Teardown Toolkit for video cards specifically. So we built all of the tools uh, exactly for video card use. So we know they work with almost every card on the market. Let's pull these two screws and then that should free it up. So these snap together, which is just odd, odd unnecessary decision. This does not need to connect. There's there's zero reason that this, is this plastic? Oh my God. Gigabyte, come on. Why? This isn't necessary. If I can do this, it's not doing anything. There's no structural support to speak of, and there's certainly no thermal benefit to this. It's probably a heat trap more than anything, as we've shown in the past. Is this amusing to everybody? So uh, that's the, and it snaps like a laptop over here. So even with the plastic BS, there's no need for this to snap together. It can just be two independent pieces. First of all, the backplate is comical. We can take that off in a second. So plastic backplate does literally nothing of value. All it's doing is stopping, this is like partly the, this is, the, the fault of the buyers. This happens because when a company releases a video card that's perfectly fine sans backplate, all the comments are, OMG, I can't believe I'm not even getting a backplate with this. This is what you're doing. They're giving you their, your stupid backplate that you want. It's just pointless. Stop asking for backplates on cheap cards. That's what you get. And that is just a waste of everyone's money. Uh, and it traps some heat back there too. We've shown that on cards recently where removing a backplate can improve thermals because if it's not doing anything, then it's just trapping stuff. But anyway, there's a plastic backplate in case you didn't believe me. Here's the card. So for the memory, this is Micron as well. It does, two gigabytes credit, make pretty direct contact with the fin stack or with a, a cold plate. Let's just go ahead and validate that material while we're at it. Steel or not steel? Not steel. Good job, gigabyte. Aluminum. So credit, credit where it's due there as well. They didn't use steel for the memory plate, which is nice. So those thermal pads look like they're about 0.5 millimeters thick and pretty direct contact with the memory. That's good. That sinks to the three heat pipes you get here. You can actually look at the imprint and see that the three heat pipes, copper pipes, 
have 100% contact with the, uh, the GPU area. So there's not much area that's uh, uncovered. Okay, so, so there's the plate, that's the memory plate. I will confess I am not 100% positive. This doesn't really feel like aluminum to me. So it's possible it's tin. All right, so the cooler, moving on from uh, that thing to stuff I know more about positively. We have copper heat pipes, aluminum cold plate, and uh, three pipes. These look to be, these are probably sixes. That's a six. So those are six mil pipes. Uh, we have the L-shaped fins over here, which is actually contacting. You can see the indent with the inductors. So that's the inductor line. There's indentations there where we're contacting the L-shape on the fins. So that's good. Uh, aluminum plate here, that is aluminum. I'm positive of that. That's aluminum contacting the fins. That's for the MOSFETs. All right, so that's the teardown. These two are very easy in general. They're not expensive cards, and typically the inexpensive ones are a lot more slimmed down on the mounting hardware. So it's easy to take them apart, maintain them. That's good. EVGA's card, I'll need to mount some probes to the memory if so. We would have had to take it apart to do this anyway because they, NVIDIA does not expose its memory temperatures, even though there's sensors on the GDDR6 that are pretty accurate, NVIDIA doesn't expose them. So we'll have to mount some sensors to it if anyone actually cares. We'll see the viewership on this video on the 1660 Super Review and then make a decision. Um, it's always a juggling act with the other stuff, like the KS is coming out as well at the same time. So we'll think about that, but in the very least, EVGA could have designed that better. Now it's just a question of how bad is it? And because there's at least contact and there is airflow, it might be an instance of acceptable but disappointing uh, or not. We'll see. Maybe. So show your interest if you actually care. That's the cards, though. The review is on the channel if you want to see how they perform. If you would like to pick up some of the stuff we use to take these apart, store.gamersnexus.net is the place to grab a toolkit or a mod mat, and they're both in stock and shipping right now. Otherwise, you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus for more information behind the scenes videos. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.